I want to talk to you about love. I'll probably say some things to you that I had not even thought I would ever say publicly because I do want to be real and sincere and somewhat vulnerable. These are the things that I tell my students. Only love can drive out darkness, fear, anxiety, and trepidation. So then, hark, hark back to the days of my youth, my formative years. I loved learning a great deal. My daddy taught me how to read as a three-year-old and a four-year-old. And I went to kindergarten a very strong and fluent reader and a confident learner. On or about the third grade, I lost my love of learning. My passion for school got up and left, and it never came back. At Garfield High School, I was told by a teacher that I didn't belong in the algebra class. He insulted me. But even then, I knew that the pen is mightier than the sword. So I wrote this article, op-ed, Sunday, March 25th, 1979. 38 years ago. I'm not responsible for the headline, but may I read it to you, please? It says, blacks at Garfield not getting proper education. You can see how old this article is. <laughs> and in those days, I had hair. This was a long time ago. And so in the article, in my summary, I said, we need to do a better job preparing students to come to this school or this institution of learning. We need to get parents to become involved. Parents, I implore you, parents become more involved in the education of your children. That's what I said as a 16-year-old. I think I just wanted my professor or my teacher of mathematics and algebra at Garfield High School to know I'm not really as stupid as you represent to me, me to be. Maybe you have the wrong perception of me. I'm really not that bad. I have some worth. That was my third grade experience in Madrona Elementary School in Madrona Park where I lived. Garfield High School. Howard University, I went there in 1980 with no money, maybe $75, and a BEOG grant. In those days, it wasn't Pell, it was called BEOG, Basic Educational Opportunity Grant. I thought that was my full ride. <laughs> I did, true, right? I was estranged from my parents, I was living on my own, sofa surfing. I was homeless in high school before I left Seattle, and I never missed one day of class. Here you see this E, and this was a logo that we crowdsourced, and my students in Bellevue, Woodenville, Seattle, and Southeast Seattle said, that's the logo we want. Wasn't the one I wanted, the one they wanted. It's an E. It's the E mode, it's a brain, right? And it's the E mode, it's the experiential, the enrichment mode of teaching. Not pencil and paper, not perfunctory, you got to do it. I'm going to put myself on the spot right now and do some math, right? See, we can always read and do everything else in public. Can't we not do a little bit of math, right? I just had a birthday two days ago. Who cares? No one, right? <laughs> not so, right? I had 250 by now responses. People are still giving me birthday wishes, right? And I'm saying to myself, here's a math problem. I have 2,260 friends on my page. So I ask you, what's the fewest number of friends I need to have such that I can say with absolute certainty and veracity that at least one day of the year, there'll be a birthday on my page of my friends? Right? Uh, Wait, maybe it's just 365, right? 365 days a year, I only need 365 friends to say that I can have a birthday on my page every day of the year. That makes sense. Well, according to the pigeonhole principle, it states that if two or more events can possibly occur, at least some of them could occur on the same day. Anybody here have a birthday in April? Okay, keep your hands up. Anybody here ever have a birthday in April 2nd, my birthday? April 2nd, right? Okay. What about this? I have 80 friends that follow me. 
I don't know why. I don't post that much. Right? I only talk about math and my grandkids. But what's the ratio of my followers to those who reply to me with my birthday messages? How many more people would I need to have in this auditorium for it to be more likely that at least one of you would also have a birthday on April 2nd? See, there's nothing wrong with thinking about math. Why is there so much fear, shame, and embarrassment, and trepidation about mathematics? Anybody here besides me, I'm already exposed. Anybody here besides me ever have any anxiety? You ever have a massive math attack, any panic attack? Anybody here ever just recoil from mathematics? Ever want just me? Right? Oh, guess what? I tell my students, don't raise your hand like this. Own it. It's like that, or it's nothing, right? My wife told me this morning, she said, Norman, I'm praying for you, because I don't want you to shout at those people, right? Because <laughs> I get kind of loud. I'm trying to really keep it down. <sighs> E-mode, fear no number. This little fellow here is one of my students, and she teaches me lots of math. I love learning. I love my students more than my own life and they know it. Before I die, here's what I want to see. Here's my dream. From sea to everlasting shiny sea, I want people, especially those that look like me, to be respected in the classrooms and have opportunities and not to recoil from mathematics, but to embrace it and go after it. That's what I want to see. I want to see students who have numerical literacy who are not afraid to do mathematical calculations. That's why I teach the Chinese abacus, Japanese abacus, and get them excited. Kids can't wait to come to our class Saturday morning from October to May. Why is that? Because it's not perfunctory. I don't care about STEM. What do you say? You don't care about STEM? I just told you you heard me. I don't care about STEM. I'm not trying to make you an engineer or a mathematician, but I do want you to be proficient and have the skills. And I want you to learn to love learning. I have students, middle schools, I see in the summer, they say, I hate school, I hate math. Well, when you hate something, you're not permeable, and you're not malleable, and how can you learn? I've been married almost 30 years. I just told my wife every day, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. Well, what would that do, right? I mean, you have to let it sink in. There's too much fear. I want people in my community all across the fruited plain to create programs like this to give our kids a place just to do math. So I lament. Why can there not be a place to do mathematics? Just for fun, just because, for no other reason than that. And if we do this K-5, we'll start sending kids to the middle school who embrace and who aren't afraid. And that's what I want to see before I die. My daddy taught me, I'm a teach. And I love teaching. Me, they'll carry out of a classroom. My hope also is that my students will also teach. Because in the summertime and on Saturdays, my students who matriculated through the program, they now become teachers. Because it looks really good when a teenager is teaching you, and then you have something to aspire and look up to be. That's what we do. It goes round and round and round. I'm not going to live forever. But this is the thing that I want you to know. There's no need for people to fear math. If we give our students opportunities and embrace them with love and compassion, when they're young, they'll be OK. But I don't want my students having the same experiences that I had. I've decided that before I leave this life, I want to burn this. I'm sick and tired of it. And I begin to wonder if we just don't get more parents to create more enrichment community-based programs in our schools to serve our kids. I'm just troubled that so many kids, especially those that look like me, report that they don't love learning. Anybody here think math enrichment in K-5 is important? Okay, thank you. So in this life, that's what I do. And I'm very, very grateful to Bellevue TEDx for having me here. I've said enough. I think you guys understand. Bless every one of you. Thank you for the opportunity.